Hey, I wanted to share some things with you. I recently watched a video of a hostage negotiator. So basically there's this guy, his name is Chris Voss, and he wrote a very popular book three years ago, uh, almost four years ago now. It's called Never Split the Difference. So he's used to be a hostage negotiator at the FBI. And since he has tried to adapt his knowledge of how to negotiate with the hostages, he's applying it to the negotiating tactics. So basically how to negotiate deals and things like that. And that's what his book is about. But I will not be summarizing his book. You can go and get the book yourself. So um, here's how the book looks like. And here's how the guy looks like. Uh, so basically what I wanted to talk about rather, normally this is how my brain works. The way I listen to anything, any content online is like this. I open a YouTube video, put my headset in and then don't even watch the video and just listen to what they're talking. And at the same time, try to apply to the context that I'm currently deeply invested in. For example, if I am currently researching a lot about influencer outreach and outreach marketing in terms of like cold emailing people, right? With some sort of request. That's what my focus is right now. So I am always, whatever I listen to around me. So let's say a YouTube video, I try to take pieces from what they said in a completely different niche and apply to that. So he was talking about, hostage negotiations and how to apply that to real estate market. So basically one layer was hostage negotiating, another layer was the real estate market, but I am adding this third layer in my brain about how can I apply the same tactics in my outreach? So how can I make it applicable to make my emails better? How can I improve my emails so that my cold emails get more response? That when I am actually in the middle of discussing with the other side, how do I get them to say yes to the things that I am hoping they will say yes for? So I'm hoping that this video will be useful to you as well. While I was being, listening to the video of Chris Foss, I basically made notes. Uh, what tips can I use from that guy in the emails that I'm writing? And interestingly, some of that I'm already using. So let's go through those. It's eight different things that I um, noted down for myself. And maybe you'll be interested to hear them as well. Let's get right into it. Okay, so this is the first thing I learned. Is that when Chris used to be on a hostage call, negotiating with the kidnapper, he never would give all his seven strategies moves in one. You, he says you never do all seven chess moves at once, right? You just give one move and wait for their response. Then you strategize which next move you're going to do, right? So I was thinking, yes, and exactly the same thing applies to email. I cannot send the influencer an email let's say a uh, panda girl is an influencer who promotes uh, fashion items, right? And then she has a YouTube channel. She has Instagram account. She has Facebook group. She has other channels, email list and so on. So there's total like eight opportunities or seven opportunities that I could have with her. So I'm not going to write the first email and say, Hey, so could you post this on your YouTube channel and maybe on your Instagram, or you could do that, or you could do this, you know, no, no, no. You just choose one thing that you want to ask her about and put that one. And depending on the reaction, then you're going to put the next one. So basically do one step at a time, one chess move at a time. And it applies to any kind of outreach when you are negotiating something or you're looking for partners or you are doing cold email, right? So do only one move at a time. Don't put the many things. When I receive emails, cold emails like that, and there are multiple things in there, you know, can you do this for us? And also we could exchange Facebook pixels and you can do that. And I'm like, oh, that's too. And then at the end, what do you think? Now I have to think, you know, about what you want. No, delete, that's gone. You know, so just try to start with just one. And personal advice for me is first things you have to ask for, you don't actually ask for, you just offer basically. So the best idea, for example, if you are an Amazon seller and you're outreaching to this Panda Girl influencer, 
the best first cold email would be this. Hi, so we are looking for new content for our audience and we would like to interview you about your business and little bit showcase a few dresses that you are selling and send to our email newsletter readers and our YouTube we will publish the video about you. So basically you mentioned nothing about yourself. You will just do videos about them, right? And that's your first thing, how to get to those big influencers. Many people these days, when you ask them about influencer marketing, they all say, don't go for the big fishes, go for the micro influencers, you know? But my opinion is, if you strategically get to those bigger influencers, you have less work to do. And there are many nice ways how you can get to them. You know, it's not like you're going to use them. They're also in business and you are in business. This is a different relationship than you're trying to go and be, oh, George Clooney, I love you, you know, come be my friend. It's not going to be like that, right? They know that you are in business and you are in business. So they will treat this relationship as a business relationship. You don't need to become their friend and pretend, you know, and go comment on everything they post and, and you know, pretend to be their fan. Nothing like that. You just offer them real value that they are, it's going to be useful for their business. And in return, you broke the ice. So for example, once you reach out to that big influencer, let's say big YouTuber called Panda Girl, she's invented person. So uh, you reach out to her saying that I will promote you on my channels, right? So I'll put you on all of the challenges that I have. And then you mention, okay, so we have 14,000 YouTube subscribers. We have that many, that many. I'll post you on all of them. Please just come out to interview with us, you know? And very likely this panda girl will have some gatekeeper that's going to scan this email, check, you know? Oh, okay, that's a lot of subscribers. Yeah, let's get, and she will arrange the call. And you get on a call and you will be just the interviewer, right? So you will say, hey, Panda Girl, so how do you do those fashion dresses? You know, what is, what's the difference between the red dresses and the blue dresses? Is there a difference in the buyers? You know, ask interesting questions and be interested. You know, many interviewers, when they interview someone, they are like typing the notes, you know. And the guy, and they mute themselves and they type the notes and not even look at the guy. You are interviewing person and your goal is not actually the interview. You will give the value to them, but your goal is to break the ice, to connect with the person. So to connect with the person, you have to show them that you hear them, you know, listen to them. Like in real life, you know, look in their eyes, look in their screen, you know, don't look in the camera. Look, I'm looking in the camera now. It doesn't even look like I'm looking at you. Look at them. You know, it's the, the laptops are built the way that when you look in their eyes in the video, actually they are looking in, 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 into your eyes. Look at this. So look, listen, nod, be interested, you know, and so on. In the interview video, if you use Zoom, for example, you know, only they will be talking. So the audience not going to even see your face, face but that person will. And that is the key in that whole system. You're basically going to listen, be interested, and honestly try to find some value for yourself when you're asking questions. So ask something that is personally interesting to you, you know? Don't fake anything. Just try to be natural, interested, and curious in that person. And, you know, the way that you make people like you is to not criticize them and be interested in what they have to say. So just be interested, you know, that's it. And that will be your first icebreaker. So I love that strategy, you know, just do one thing at a time. And like I said, my personal advice is do the first things that are 100% value to them. Once you pass that, you know, once they know you now and you've done a few things that you promoted them and they know you already, then you can ask, hey, I saw you have a um, YouTube channel as well. So do you also take guests, you know? And then just ask like that or, or whatever. You will already have the comfort level there that you can ask it's completely different than sending a cold email and saying hey put me there put me there you know so there you go that's the first thing let's go to the next one now okay the second thing that i learned is he says don't end with the bad news start with the bad news it's very interesting you know because very often when i was doing cold outreach before in all kinds of situations, not exactly influencer marketing, right? Now I'm, I'm investigating influencer marketing, but before I was just doing partnership negotiations, all kinds of other things, right? And I would do like this. So I say, oh, thank you for posting about us, something, something, and thank you that, thank you this, all the good things first, and then post scriptum. Oh, by the way, 
So can you put us on this um, YouTube channel that you mentioned that you have, you know, like, and then the people have the feeling that, ah, so you are giving me all these good things just to ask for something at the end, you know? So that was my mistake that I was doing at the end in the postscriptum. I was always putting this something, the negative. So what he's calling negotiator says, don't give a bad news. But in our case, when you do cold outreach and you're doing the bad news is sort of whatever gives the negative feeling a little bit. And when you're asking for something, it always gives people a little bit negative feeling. Now negotiator says that you should start with that. Start with something like, Oh, I'm afraid I have bad news. So you prepare them for it. And then you start with it. And then you give all the good things. So you end with good things always. And then the last thing is what they remember about the whole email. Whatever you say last is how they feel. And that feeling is frozen in time later when they try to remember what it was about. So if you're asking as a postscriptum, oh, and here's my ask, you know, this is what I want you actually to do. So all of this, I basically did because I'm asking that you know, they will feel uncomfortable. And even if they say yes, it's like with a negative connotation. Now, instead, you could start with that. You could say, hey, so I saw you have this YouTube channel that you mentioned in our interview. Uh, would you consider inviting me uh, as an interviewer? Just ask. And then they're already like a little bit negative, right? And then you're giving them all the good news. And so here's what I posted about you. And so many people send me an email. Here are screenshots of what they asked. And they loved your interview. And here are how many views we had, how many conversions I sent you. And this is all the stats. And you end up with a good thing. And he's like super happy. So now he already forgotten that in the beginning you asked. And now he will suddenly feel like, Hmm, so what can I do for them? You know, like natural instinct is to say thank you, you know, and how can I say thank you in business? It's, it's like, you know, they've done so much for me, what I can do for them. Oh yeah, they asked for this YouTube thing. Okay, let me reply about that. No, YouTube is not going to be possible, but I have an opportunity for you there. This is how it naturally usually goes. So there you go. That's the second thing that I learned. Don't end with the bad things. Start with the bad things and then end with the good note. So. It's a nice one. Another one that I learned is that you have to show people that you're listening. So for negotiator, it's easy, right? Show that you're listening. So basically when the hostage is talking something, negotiator shouldn't just switch to what he wants. He should basically comment on the things person said and talk about those things only, right? And in the terms of email, how I apply it now. So you know, sometimes people tell you, for example, I did a cold outreach and then the person replied. He said, Polina, it's cute, but you only have 2000 followers, you know, and that was the email. And then, you know, so instead I could have just like ignore the whole thing and then just start to, oh, I don't have too many followers because it's so expensive to get them on Facebook and, and try to make excuses and just whatever. I would basically ruin it, you know? Instead, you have to hear what they're saying, you know? Don't start covering and proving yourself right. Just jump on their side, you know? So instead, don't say, oh, yes, I don't have, but because it's so expensive. Instead, say, point taken on number of followers. That's it, you know, point taken on number of followers. You understand what they're saying. And the next sentence say, but like you could say, but what do you think about this opportunity? You know, I could promote you there, there, something like that, right? So now this point taken on number of followers, it's like you are reacting to what he said. You're not ignoring what he said. This really makes them feel like you're listening. I'll give you another example. Sometimes people, you send a cold email, then they replied, okay, let's do it. For example, they would say, okay, let's do it. And, oh, I think retail arbitrage maybe is not the right topic, but we can look, think about it. Ha, ha, ha. Let's say he said like that. And then you would reply what a bad reply would be to that. Bad reply would be to just say, okay, sounds good. Book a call here and give a link. That is completely ignoring the little joke that they made, right? retail arbitrage something but let's think about it ha 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 you know so you're ignoring that you're like okay whatever you said great book a call with me you know you're like putting yourself first so try to listen to what they say even you are in the email try to respond to the things that they commented on you know 
So don't ignore it like it completely didn't happen. He made a joke about retail arbitrage and laughed a little bit. So you make sure in a sentence, first sentence to react to that. You're going to say, okay, so yeah, retail arbitrage would be interesting. I see what you're saying. You know, something like that. Just show them that you heard it. And then, okay, so let's chat here and then give your link to book a call or whatever your goal is, right? So try to always comment a little bit on what they said because every person, when they open the email, when they, when they make a joke or when they say something, they're looking for a reaction in another person. They're looking for a reaction. If you don't give them any reaction, they feel like, so he doesn't give a shit about me, you know? Like, he doesn't care about me. Okay, so I will not make a joke next. You know, like... You want them to feel that you heard them and you understand them and you like them. And the more you respond to people's jokes, you know, you laugh at their jokes or you react to what they say, the more they like you. Actually, that's how it goes. People like when you're listening to them, you know, it, it's nice. Uh, so that's a, a nice thing that I learned from the negotiator, you know. Uh, there's another thing that I learned. Chris said, people love to correct you. And when they correct you, they're the most concise. So their reply will be short and they will be most honest. Because when people are correcting you rather than stating something from scratch, they are much less likely to exaggerate, make it beautiful or, or whatever. They are more honest in their moment when they're correcting you. So that's a very good relationship building moment. You are bonding closer because you hear some truth from their side. So how does that apply to emails now? So I would say, so I know that on your YouTube channel, you are posting only purses and belts and accessories. And I have seen that you, it seems like you have been declining any requests for dresses, reviews or, or box openings. So. Uh, I feel like this product would be a very nice match with this, this, this accessory, you know, but um, as I understand, you are not doing that right now. So instead, would you consider maybe creating a video for us that you would send that we instead would use in our marketing, you know? So now all I said, this is assumptions of about their channel, right? And then it's very likely that she will get back to you saying, no, we have not declined dresses. This just, just had, didn't come up, you know, and nobody has offered or, or whatever. They're going to correct you. And in that correction, you are getting a little bit closer to them. Their relationship is being built. You know, you learn about what works. And very often they will say, no, we haven't declined dresses because we, we worked with all the accessories, only blue color, you know, and the, uh, we haven't had any blue dresses come in or whatever. I'm just inventing. So it will be some reason that she gives you and that reason will, reason will open up your eyes to her insight more. And then you can, you can understand her situation better. And that always helps to understand her situation better because then you know well, what to offer and what's going to work, you know. So your success, chance of success is much higher after that. So here's another one. Chris says, empathy has nothing to do with the reality. So what he means is that when you are empathizing, when you're trying to feel the situation from other person's point of view, sometimes you will disagree with their truth. And it's often that it happens in life. You're talking to someone, but you want to stay friends. So you don't jump into fighting, whatever they say. Every sentence they say, you fight your own truth and you just, mm -mm -mm. and in the end they feel like, oh, this guy doesn't understand, you know? He, he always says I'm wrong. He's just thinking I'm wrong always. And they feel uncomfortable to talking to you further, you know? Very often it's nice to show other person that you feel their position, you understand their point of view. So, but what Chris said, it's not always that that truth is what you believe is true. So it doesn't have to be true what they're saying. You just have to show empathy for whatever they're saying, even if you feel it's wrong, right? So I was thinking, hmm, how does that apply to the emails now? Okay, so for example, I offered the influencer, the panda girl, I will say, hey, I will promote your dresses on my um, 
LinkedIn page, for example, right? And then she replies, hmm, LinkedIn doesn't really work for us. This is not where our audience hangs out, right? And now you're suddenly thinking, what there is, you know, there are still girls, they're still buying dresses. She only means Instagram and Pinterest works for her, but I believe in LinkedIn works, but I don't want to jump and start explaining, no, LinkedIn works well, don't believe in that, I would be fighting her. I should show empathy to her, say, um, this is true, I, I see your point. So what if, and then you talk about Instagram and Pinterest, whatever. So basically agree with her point. Don't fight it. You know, if she said no, she's already not ready. Later on at some point, you can, you can put that back in the LinkedIn, right? But he already, she already declined it. So with her own truth, just understand her truth. You know, if she believes that, let it be so, you know, just agree with her point and move on to something else. So this is very interesting, you know, how, um, how to think about that even if they're not saying what you believe is truth you still empathize with them this is a very nice one chris also said that people go to experts first before they go to salespeople. this is very interesting and in reality you know if you are trying to sell let's say you're selling your dresses and you just in your email you will say Oh, uh, so here's the dresses that we sell. They are awesome and buy them and think about the affiliate program. We are amazing. Work with us. You know, there was nothing about them in it. And it's just completely doesn't even show any expertise that you have. There is no reason for them to even want to work with you. But very often people go to search first. Let's say they will search about the dresses, you know, they will, what Panda Girl influencer would want about the dresses? She's already selling her own dresses, let's say, on her own YouTube channel. So she would probably be interested in what type of strategies work to attract all kinds of audience. So now if you somehow get in her eyes as an expert in that area, like if you have some kind of videos or content that you created that actually show is showing you as an expert in that field then she may come to you rather than going to that salesperson who's just selling the dresses right she will come to you as an expert and so everywhere in any niche this works best you know people don't like going to car salesmen they like to go to the websites which review cars right to some expert or watch youtube channel who's talking about cars you know so they go to the expert first and that's who they will believe later they only go to salesperson to complete the transaction most of the time and the same applies with emailing so whatever you are looking for as an outcome in your business partnership or, or negotiating something or influencer outreach or whatever, even with the Amazon customer um, tickets, you know, when you're replying to them and they want a refund and you don't want to give them a refund, something like that. You know, it's, it's, it's important to consider that. Um, even in your newsletter, I think it's important to portray yourself and as an expert when you're sending a newsletter to your Shopify email subscribers you know, rather than saying, hey, this sale on this dress, this sale on this item, now this sale is not item, it's boring newsletter. It's much better to portray yourself as an expert, like um, the apple-shaped bodies go better with these dresses, you know, if you have pear-shaped body, go with, you know, some kind of expertise that you're adding to that. So people definitely will be much more attracted to your content that way. So I was thinking I will apply that in my cold emails that I'm doing. And instead of pushing what I have to sell to them, I will just talk about the niche, you know, just show my expertise, you know, aha, uh -huh, yes. Well, the fashion industry has been going down in France, but I've heard that in Italy, they actually, the floral pattern has been popular with the recent trend, you know? So I think that the florals are really coming this year. You know, talk something like that. It will give you as an expert, portray you as an expert of your niche, and that person will be automatically interested in who are you and what you have to sell, you know? So you start as an expert and the salesperson much, much later after that. And the last one that I wrote down is that situation drives your strategy. So you can't really think, oh, I'm going to get this influencer to say this, 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 and post this on YouTube channel, you know, and he will do this video. No, you have to be very flexible because big influencers may say no, but they may have other opportunities. Maybe a picture on Instagram is easier for them or maybe something else. You know, it's not, you start with something 
and then you drive your strategy from that. So, so this last one is for me. I would say that in whatever email outreach you're doing, so partnerships, influencer marketing, or customers uh, to buy more from you and um, things like that, my suggestion is that do icebreakers first. So offer value first. Like many people on other YouTube channels are saying, give value first and then you can ask in return. Well, normally I don't even ask for anything in return. They offer it, right? And if they don't offer it, I don't even ask. So basically you just offer value. Now, how does this work? So like I mentioned, you'll do the interview or, or um, let's say you are now wanting more sales with your email newsletter, right? You are selling some product and you want more sales. What you should do? Well, so email them instead of asking them, buy my product, buy my product, buy my product, give them information as an expert. So here is how, you know, you, you bought, tell them you bought medium sized dress and this dress that you bought is a line, you know, and here are the other three dresses from our collection that there's also a line and this one will hide your shoulders. You know, this one will do this. This one will do that. Whatever the, the thing is, you know, show some, not really push those dresses, but show your expertise in explaining the benefit of each product to them. So try to do icebreakers with them first, something that gives them value first and only then you will get your return. Make the positive waves in the world and the positive waves will come back to you, you know? So that's basically my advice on email marketing. And mm, I loved this guy, you know, this Chris Voss negotiator. He is so good. I just, he has this super smart mind, you know, but I just want to listen and listen and listen what he has to say. Oh, he's so awesome. Just look him up on YouTube and you will see for yourself. He's amazing. Cheers.